talking about this new collection of standards, ISO IEC 2838, that's a misprint already. And um, this is a standard under the auspices of the Joint Technical Committee of ISO and the International Electrotechnical Commission. Uh, Lisa mentioned that standards are all about compatibility and interoperability. This is a, an, uh, a screenshot from the homepage of the Joint Technical Committee. Uh, giving some examples of what this Joint Technical Committee has brought out so far. Many, many other examples could be mentioned. And um, we have just put through a new standard. Uh, so Michael Gruninger has been involved in this. I have been involved in this. It was originally uh, sponsored by the Army, which has uh, a lot of different uses for a lot of different ontologies, and they were requiring some sort of uh, methodology or strategy for bringing about compatibility and interoperability between all of those ontologies. And so they went to ISO and this brought forth the collection uh, that we're talking about today. And this is now uh, approved. Um, it's not yet been published, although it's ready to be published and um, like uh, the next standard I'm going to be talking about, it's also going to be in the public domain. So you won't have to pay for this standard. You can just uh, download it uh, as many times as you like and it's cost free. Uh, now the goal behind uh, part one of the standard is or was originally to formalize this idea that the way you create interoperability between ontologies is to uh, respect to hub and spokes structure, where the hub would be what is called a top level ontology, which is what part one of the standard is all about. And the spokes and the spokes uh, coming out of the spokes would be relatively more general ontologies compared to the spokes at lower levels, which would be relatively more specific ontologies. So the hub would contain terms like object, process, um, event quality and so forth. And the spokes would contain terms like animal, cell, electron, planet, tennis ball, dollar bill, and so forth. So this, this was the idea which has been pursued by several ontology communities over the last 20 years, but not by all ontology communities. Now, to see what the idea involves, we'll consider a couple of examples, the pro provenance ontology and the semantic center network ontology. This is a screenshot of the upper parts of the provenance ontology. And you can see that the top level terms in this ontology are as follows. And this is a screenshot of the upper parts of the semantic center network ontology. And the top level terms here are quite different. Now, it's already proven that the very same people who want to use PROV to annotate their data in order to keep track of its provenance, for instance, intelligence community people, also want to use the SSN because a lot of their data is sensor data. They want to keep track of the provenance of sensor data. But you can't merge the top levels of these two ontologies because they contain a quite different repertoire of ways of describing what exists on this top level of highly general terms. And so the idea arose that we might need just one top level ontology. And this, this proposition is advanced in this paper, for instance, in 2009. I have been advancing it for 20 years. The Army uh, has been supporting this particular view for uh, at least 10 years, and that this particular view was indeed the uh, raison d'etre for ISO 21838. Now, so ISO 21838 specifies the requirements of being a top level ontology. Ontology is defined here, so basically it's a collection of terms plus links connecting those terms plus definitions, with all of which is formalized. So I won't go into any more detail about this. The ontologies are made up of terms. The terms represent classes or types like animal or planet at the domain level and like object or property or process 
at the top level. And now we can define a category as being a very, very general class or type. That means domain neutral. So object is domain neutral because it can be applied in any domain. Spider is not domain neutral. It's very domain specific. Top level ontologies are only interested in domain neutral terms, uh, which means terms that can be used precisely to unify a lot of ontologies at lower levels in the hierarchy, domain ontology. So then there were two requirements or two sets of requirements for being a top level ontology in accordance with 21838. One is that they should be domain neutral and the other is that they should be maximally general also in a second sense, namely that they cover everything. So they cover nothing in specific, but they cover everything in general. And so the problem was, how do we uh, verify that an ontology is maximally general in this sense? And the way we did this was we created a list of kinds of data. Now, ontologies are primarily used for tagging data. So at an ontology to try to uh, um, be validated at the top level ontology in the terms of the standard has to show that it can data pertaining to all of these different kinds of things. So it has to be able to be with space, time, change, scale, and so forth. This, this is the criterion that we adopted. The second requirement has to do with how it's presented. So we said that in order to be a top level ontology in accordance with the standard, you have to have textual definitions understandable by a human being. OWL axiomatization, so an equivalent set of definitions, but expressed in OWL, as, as equivalent as you can manage anyway. And then an axiomatization in common logic, which means first order logic plus the, the extra uh, pieces of equipment which common logic provides. And then we also require that there should be a proof of consistency for the common logic axiomatization and the proof of derivability of the OWL axiomatization from the common logic. And now there are three top level ontologies which are candidates in principle for um, uh, meeting these requirements. I'll mention uh, a fourth candidate uh, in a minute. Um, these are the three candidates which have already existed for some years, have users around the world, have proved themselves in battle. Uh, one is basic formal ontology, which I'm going to be talking about here primarily. The other is Dolce, and the third one is Sumo. Dolce has put itself forward to become an ISO standard top-level ontology in conformity with 21838-1. And so I'm going to, that, that will be uh, this particular, sorry, th this is BFO. This has already been approved like part one. It's not yet been published, but it will be published within the next weeks. Uh, there are um, legal hurdles which have nothing to do with the content, but rather with the precise way in which the content was presented. We have overcome these legal hurdles, but ISO goes very slowly and it, it can only start publishing when the lawyers give the say so. The lawyers have already approved BFO to become not just an ISO standard, but also in the public domain. And this you can already access. So this is BFO 2020. This is the version of BFO which has been accredited by ISO as conformant to 21838 part one. And the whole of the ontology is available for download at that link and um, in, in the various different uh, formats that I, I, I mentioned. So our common logic, the proof is in the folder called model and then the natural language version are in three forms. Requirements that you need to have the ontology available in these three forms together with proofs. And these are three major top level ontology camps. Um, BFO, Basic Formal Ontology, has already been approved to become ISO 21838-2. Uh, 
and it's in process of being published and it will be published within the next weeks and um, it will be available as i said free in the public domain and this material which is the content of bfo 2020 is already available and you can download everything at that link and this includes the common logic representation of bfo the proofs which are in the folder called model and the owl representation and then it includes also the free text or natural language text representations in the bfo 2020 links there now a second top level ontology dolce has also been put forward as a candidate ontology conforming to ISO IEC 21838 part one. And, and this is in process, so this has not yet been approved. And uh, then a third approach, Topper, uh, has been uh, put forward as a um, uh, 21838-4 ontology approach. And Michael Gruninger, I'm assuming, will be talking about Topper in his presentation later. Now, so we said the hub and spokes approach, it underlies the way in which we envisage interoperable ontology modules being created. At the, at the moment, most ontologies are created in ad hoc ways, and so they do not link to other ontologies. And so people who need two ontologies, when they try and put the existing ontologies together to create an ontology which will be unified to meet their needs, find that it breaks. And so people are very frustrated typically when they try to follow the ontology method to achieve interoperability. And ISO 21838 is an answer to those frustrations. So we are better off with just one ontology on the web. Uh, now I think that should be BFO. Uh, it may be that we end up with three. That would also be better than the current chaos. Uh, I'm going to just assume that we'd be better off with just one, and I'm going to give some uh, indication of why I think that should be BFO. So first of all, an indication having to do with knowledge graphs, um, BFO is massively well used in the LOD cloud, the linked open data cloud. And there is no other ontology which is used at all. So in this paper, um, the, the authors, Armin Haller and Axel Polaris, established that uh, while BFO is used overwhelmingly for life science data, there is no evidence that either Dolce or Sumo are used anywhere. And as we all know, the linked open data cloud is gigantic. The, the red stuff, which is also the most well linked stuff, that, that, that's what it means when you see black down there at the bottom of the screen. This is the life science stuff. And life science was the first area to witness massive use of ontologies. It's still the area where ontologies are most systematically used. It's the area where the most scientific uses of ontologies have established themselves. And BFO is in the middle of that area. So the bioscience ontologies are built. They are spoke with BFO as uh, either immediate or And so that there are ontologies now extending BFO in this way. The other 50 are in areas like engineering, which we'll discuss briefly in a minute. So there is a textbook about BFO uh, where we describe how to build ontologies using BFO. Uh, and we do this also in Chinese in case anyone is interested. And um, we have a, a manual, a, a paper describing tools for uh, creating suites of ontologies so the over using BFO. The first suite using BFO was the over And um, we've already seen this. This BFO 2020. It's very similar to BFO 2.0, which was its immediate predecessor. There are two or three very minor changes in the term hierarchy. There is a hierarchy. Uh, the relational uh, content of BFO 2020 is much richer the content of the earlier version. And it's already beginning to have since we've been forced now 
2020. Um, and there are already which are units are exploring using it, which is true of ISO 1596 and it's true of STEP in the sense that we have a working group exploring how STEP can be related to BFO uh, for purposes of the IOF, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we have a working group for using BFO to create a standard mid-level ontology. That's another army-sponsored uh, venture. And we have working groups also with the, the uh, Joint AI Center and the DOD IC ontology working group where we're creating a DOD IC ontology suite. And then there are a number now of BFO-based engineering ontologies uh, which uh, form the industrial ontologies foundry, uh, which is run um, by uh, people at NIST. And um, where we have uh, very regular meetings Workers meet weekly, uh, developing different parts of this suite. And I'll just give you some examples of the papers which have appeared just in the last month. Uh, this is the maintenance. Technology. This is the uh, um, uh, paper on showing empirically how interoperability between disparate engineering ontologies by re-engineering them using BFO. Uh, Simulation to support manufacturing based on BFO. So that's the end the, um, of the, the slide. I'll just spend a couple of minutes giving you an indication of the content of BFO 2020. Um, so I'll just use this one slide. Um, if you think about space and time, then there are various uh, different of relations you need to see that. So spatio-temporal relations are going to be related to temporal, sorry, spatio-temporal regions are going to be related to temporal regions and to spatial regions in projection relation. Uh, the projection on temporal regions is atemporal. Um, so every spatio-temporal region has a certain temporal region as its temporal extent Buster. That's always atemporally the case. But which a spatial region, a spatio-temporal region, projects onto varies from one time to the next. And so the projection relation between a spatio-temporal region and a spatial region has to all is a ternary relation. It always has to specify the time at which it occurs. Now. Owl, as we know, so we have found a way to binaryize at relations, at in the sense of at a time. And that's why the relational repertoire of BFO 2020 is so much richer than what we had earlier. And to our knowledge, there is no other ontology which, in the owl space, knows how to deal with time in what we see as the proper way of dealing with time, uh, namely to, to binaryize the ternary XT relation. Some of which hold atemporally, some of which hold at time T. I don't need to go through these relations, but you see that we've worked pretty hard to axiomatize the relations, not just between Spatial, temporal, and temporal regions also be processes which occur in material entities which are located in spatial regions. At times, material entities move around, and material entities which are located in sites, for instance, a rabbit in a rabbit hole, and so forth. So, we have what we think is a very rich spatio-temporal relation architecture, and we think we have a rich um, architecture for dealing with other kinds of things also. And uh, so, you, and you're all welcome to explore at the links that I provided earlier.